Hi, this is Rick Adams from practicalcsm.com, and you are currently listening to part two of a three-part recording of my recent conversation with Rav Daliwal, investment partner at Crane Venture Partners, entitled Customer Success Management from the Investor's Perspective. You can find part one on my Practical CSM YouTube channel, and the final part, part three, will be released very soon. Now, enjoy part two. The unit cost is irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the unit economics in a SaaS, recurring SaaS model business are very, very attractive. From, yes, uh, from an very, very, very scalable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say that, you know, predictability comes into it, into the picture there, yeah, in terms of revenues. Well, it, well, what would hope so. Uh, but I mean, I think this is the journey that, uh, you know, VCs can really help companies go on is, you know, what is the right pricing model? What's the right distribution model, for example, because, you know, if you're a consumption based service, then you may not have as, you may have predictability, but not as much as, uh, you, you know, a flat fee type business, or is it a combination of both? So, uh, but generally, you know, from a recurring revenue perspective, uh, it's much easier to sort of model out what the business is likely to look at when you start to uh, modify other variables. If we increase headcount, if we ship products quicker, etc., if we deploy quicker, you, you know, it, you, you could get a much better sense of how the business is likely going to be tracking. Yeah, and that's that, and now again, that comes from that predictability, doesn't it? Because, I mean, if if I know from the last two three years that I've got you know an eighty percent uh, retention level, and uh, I know how, how many what my revenues were, you know, I know what what I've sold, and uh, and and if we make the assumption that we can continue to do that, then we can we can predict some revenues going forwards in, in, into into the future, and as you say, start yeah. to sort of use multipliers to say, well, if we did this much more marketing or whatever. Uh, yeah, then assuming that the total addressable market will bear it, then you know this this is this is how we can grow the business. So I can see why that's very attractive. And also, yeah, the, you know, you mentioned then about you know about the the sort of the end game, which may well be perhaps uh, you know a sale of the company. Of course, again, when when if someone was looking or another company was looking to purchase that company, again, it it's it's it's, it's what they're looking for, isn't it? To be able to take over a company that already has. A, a good strong revenue stream from existing customers is so much mm. so much more attractive. It's actually, right? it's interesting. It's not always the case that companies get acquired because of, they make a lot of money. Sometimes you want to acquire to get rid of a competitor and just shut it down. Sometimes you want to acquire because you want the talent. Uh, I would argue that Salesforce has bought Quip because they wanted the, the technology, but they really wanted the founder, right? Who is now, you know, CTO and vice president, I believe, of the company. So um, you can make an aqua hire. Sometimes you want it because the company offers a capability which you need or you have a gap in what you are offering your customers. So it's not always the case of, wow, this is a really healthy business. Which is, that's that's definitely like a Cisco um, type type acquisition is you know is, is to, to add it to their portfolio and 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 to, and to, to fill the gaps uh, most and, and, large yeah, uh, yeah. So, most large companies especially most large software companies all have cork dev arms looking at startups right with you know who's what are they building what direction are they moving in is this something we should be thinking about should we look keep an eye on these to acquire them should and we they even invest, invest in them, in them right? right so that, correct yeah, yeah. That, yeah yeah which i think is very exciting yeah. as well but anyway i guess we're getting a little bit yeah. sorry getting a little bit off topic it's only it's only because I'm, I'm just i just find it fascinating so uh but let's let's get that back to the topic of customer success management and why customer success and, and just to be clear when i say customer success i mean the customer satisfactorily attaining value from their purchase and utilization of whatever they do mm -hmm. yeah the solution that they purchase that's what i mean by customer success so why yeah. customer success might be very important from the perspective of the venture capitalist i'm interested to explore that with you and i realize this should be self-evident by now from our conversation but just to connect the dots you tell me why might customer success and therefore of course customer success management be of interest to the vc who is funding the company well, this is a, a terrific question, and I will preface the question by saying I am fortunate to work in a fund where there is a philosophical understanding that making customers successful is really important. 
I can't say that's the case for every other venture capitalist I have spoken to. Okay. But they're good ones. They're really good ones. <laughs> they basically they get it. They basically uh, they basically understand that if you are going to be a successful company, there will come a point maybe in year four, five, six, or seven of your existence where the vast majority of your revenue, your new revenue, is coming from your existing customers. And so if you are not doing a good job at keeping your existing customers, your business is going to get less and less viable as time goes on, right? So um, there is a, uh, a very famous graph floating around. I can send it to you after as a chart of, uh, of, a, of a SaaS company, incredibly successful. You can see the bookings line just keeps going up and up and up and up and up and up. And then in year five, there's an inflection and the bookings from the install base suddenly start outstripping bookings from new customers by an astronomical amount. And that company was Salesforce.com. Yeah, I was about to say. Right? It was <laughs> and so, yeah, so, and that is, that is the trajectory of just about every successful yeah. Yeah. software business. If you want to be a billion dollar revenue company, you can't do it if you're losing customers. You just can't. Yeah. No. So it's, it's like um, filling a bucket that's got a hole in it. Exactly. It's a, le- it's a leaky bucket. And, uh, and, and essentially, if you're in a startup and you're doing well and you've got a lot of momentum and then you have not addressed customers in any meaningful way and they're not seeing value, you're losing them, trying to fix that at a speed at which you are moving is almost impossible. Like it's just impossible. So the velocity of what you're doing in the business of hiring, go to market, marketing, building a product, all this sort of stuff, the speed at which you're having to do everything without enough time, resource, and not enough money, if you suddenly then have to go, wow, actually we're leaking customers, we've got to figure that out, it's too late by that point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you haven't got it. So, so it tells you about the product as well, in other words. Oh, or how it's sold or who you're selling it to, because it may well be the product's great. You're just selling it to the wrong people. Yeah, okay, good. So thank you for that. And um, are you seeing situations perhaps where the VC is proactively recommending or even insisting upon customer success management as a key part of the business. I mean, going back to what you were saying and you were correcting me about what, what, what goes into the contract and you're saying, well, it's not as granular as perhaps I was suggesting. Um, but you know, what, what, what type of advice are venture capitalists giving or what type of pressure are they putting on, on the, on the decision makers, on the owners of the business in terms of, you know, influencing them into thinking about funding and provisioning a customer success management function. Yeah, I mean, I think good VCs are always trying to influence uh, for a positive outcome, but the level of influence you have is going to be tied to, you know, do you have a board seat? Are you a board observer? What's your relationship like with the founders? Do they trust you, et cetera, et cetera? So um, that, that, that's no different than to being a CSM with a, comp- with a customer, right? You, uh, how much they listen to you and how much you're, they let you influence them is going to depend on, you know, the level of investment they're making and, and so you're a, you're a, uh, coach, and, and you're a coach or a guide or a mentor you're not a decision maker correct. basically yeah, yeah correct but it's, it's different if you are actually on the board and you have a seat because then you have a fiduciary responsibility right so then you have a legal responsibility and a vote, so, right correct yeah exactly now um y- y- you know it, so if you're on a board seat it's a very different thing than uh simply making an investment and then trying to influence and help the um to answer your question is uh, the really forward thinking investors are really trying to help the companies lay a foundation for long-term success. So they are looking at the business from every single aspect. Uh, Now the challenge is uh, in the venture world in particular, the idea of success is still not as well understood as one would hope it would be. And that is actually, I think uh, we'll talk about this later I think that is a byproduct of, I think, some challenges in the success profession uh, and some of the mindset in the success profession. Yes. But it's also, okay. broadly, it's also, but also broadly just a lack of general awareness. So, like I say, I've been very fortunate. I've met a bunch of people who are very, very terrific, actually terrific investors, know what they're doing, who philosophically kind of are aligned with, actually, yes, what we realize is if this is a really important lever to make our portfolio companies successful and therefore to make us successful. And um, more and more of that DNA is now starting to spread into investment arms. You, you sort of see they have an entrepreneur in residence. They, 
are hiring more people with my kind of background. And you're sort of slowly starting to see greater understanding that actually this isn't just a function. It's not a function that just focuses on reducing churn. It's actually a massive engine for driving growth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and and those are two. I mean, and the, and the, and those are actually two sides of the of the same coin, aren't they? So, and it, it's interesting because you could be you, you you could be two different people looking at that coin, looking at customer success management function, with two very different aspects of it, two different sides to it, as you say, it, 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 because because actually, in in a sense, you could be looking at say, well, that's just about churn reduction, uh, but actually, churn reduction is about not having a leaky bucket and if you've got a leaky bucket yeah you've got to turn that tap on much harder and that means you've got to pay your water board more money for in other words you know it's it's going to cost a lot more marketing etc so or not even be possible because the because of the of the market size and so on i, um, I think the so, challenge i think the challenge rick is 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 every enterprise software company i, I invest in enterprise software companies right right every enterprise software company at some level wants to become the next Salesforce, right? That's what they want to do. That, 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 that was a company that had a mission to make cloud a thing, hugely successful, very well respected company. But, and it pioneered really modern customer success. I think it started in Oracle, but Mark Benioff took it and popularized it. But what people don't realize is the history behind that and why there are so many people focused on the customer at Salesforce is it was as a response to 8% and a rising churn. Right? It was a completely reactive thing. Now, what we, what we want to have happen in companies that we invest in is to not wait to the point where you're seeing seven, eight percent churn and then react to it because the capital expenditure you would then need to fix that problem is enormous, right? What we want to do is help you to lay down a foundation where you're thinking about this through how you build a product, how you sell, how you deploy, how you grow, how you expand. So customer success is in a department it's a mindset for how the business thinks, right? So if you can actually get that education and influence into the company, and then you can uh, coach founders around, well, you should build an incentive structure across the business that drives that behavior, then you're actually not reacting to anything. It's just the way you operate. Yeah, so it's a philosophical position as well as a, a horizontal function. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I, part I of the totally problem, and I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm actually writing a, a, a medium article to follow up the last one I did on this problem. Part of the challenge, your problem with customer success is it's a role, it's a function, and it's a mindset, and people use those interchangeably. <laughs> That's the problem, and I think. If, well, and, yeah, and by the way, say, this is why I said when I said customer success, and then you'll notice I, I then you explain it, yes. because customer success is not customer success management, right? Customer success Correct. management is the management of customer success. Right? That's what it is. Um, so you're hundred percent right. Yeah. And that's the problem. But people just Everyone use these terms just, just totally without thinking what they're saying. Correct. Completely, inter completely interchangeably. Which, or sometimes doesn't matter use, most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they use customer success to mean customer experience or yes. actually, our, yes. yes, or a customer success team in, in comprises training, support, education, blah, blah, blah. So what, one of the things that I do very regularly when I work with founders is to say, what I want you to do is to not think of your business in terms of pre-sales and post-sales and think of it as a production line, right? What I want you to think about is there's a period when the customer's a prospect and then there's a period where we just grow the customer. Right? That's what you want to think about. Prospect phase, growth phase. Right? So, so try not to think of the business as a production line and at the end of the production line is the people who talk to customers. That will, that will ultimately be an inhibitor for growth because as you scale the organization up, people are going to get further and further and further away from the customer and that's going to make your business harder and harder and harder. Right. Yeah. No, definitely. All right. Uh, so uh, can we... Maybe look at the, um, the the business reporting side of things, because I think that that's something that that again I would envision is is very dear to the heart of the venture capitalists. Is they yeah you know, they're going to want information. They're going to they're going to want to keep their finger on the pulse of of, of how well the, the company is doing. So in in terms of business reporting. Um, uh, obviously, the VC is going to be keen to, as I say, to keep track of revenues and you know see what's happening, understand the, the potential for growth, um, 
but I would say that revenues is a lagging indicator, right? I mean, I, I presume you, you would sort of go along with me on, on that. It tends well, to be more, more, of a, uh, more of a lagging indicator uh, of, of success. Annual recurring revenue is for sure, yeah. Yeah, annual recurring revenue is for sure. I mean, obviously, ACV is more of a leading one, but yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, that's, yeah, again, that's part about. of the challenge. Sales as a leading indicator, success as a lagging one. That's also part of the challenge. Yeah. So, all right. So, so let's yeah. talk about other indicators. So, uh, I imagine that for the, like for the venture capitalists, especially in the, in the early growth stages, which of course is where, when venture capitalists will get, be involved anyway by their nature, tends to be. Yeah. Uh, they're actually looking at other indicators that might give a clearer prediction of future success and more more of the leading indicators. So, how do customer success management activities tie into that and tie into the types of performance analysis and business reporting that a VC might want to see happening within the business? Well, it's an interesting one, and there, uh, all of this depends on what stage the company is in, right? Because if you are in a seed stage investment, they're still working on the product. There's still there's some product market fit, but we're working towards, you know, really getting the product ready for the right sort of market. Most of the sales are founder-led sales. At that point, unit economics is going to be, you know, if, a, if an investor is asking you about unit economics at that stage, they don't know what they're talking about because what you really need, what you really need to focus on is product market fit, right? How do I accelerate the speed at which I get the product ready? Yeah. Because without, so without that, there is no unit economics. So it's, <laughs> as a, an, an efficiency can come later kind of thing. Correct. So what, what less about efficiency, it's much more, if, if you're starting to orient at this very early stage around, you know, cost of customer acquisition, you know, LTV to CAC ratio, all this sort of stuff, um, the business is still in an experimental phase. So really what you want to be doing is to say, tell us about the customers that you have, tell us about the value you're getting, tell us what you are doing to make them see that value quickly what are you learning about the product that needs to change? What are the characteristics of your successful customers versus the ones that are unsuccessful? Because what you're trying to do is build a picture of what do we need to build both from a product, but also a commercial arm to accelerate everything that's working. Yeah. Um, then when you actually get to a point where I think, okay, we feel like we've got really good product market fit, at least in this segment, and we're getting we're getting a good repeatable sales motion because so we're we cranking really up understand our, sales our customers. We understand their needs. Yep. You know, they're they're giving us fantastic feedback. We're responding to it. We're adapting our our, our product to fit those needs, and we've got evidence to show that they're you know they're yep. delighted with 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 the product and can't get enough of it. And I'm starting to then scale up the commercial approach. Then you can actually start to really, and then you can do that quite quickly within a year even, then you can start thinking about more traditional unit economics, you know, what's the MRR, ARR, ACV. Um, in those early stages, MRR in particular, is just a really good gauge of how close you're getting to product market fit, <laughs> right? Because what you're sort of saying is, well, MRR is trending up. Uh, so that means we're selling more and more, and people are using the service more so and just more. To be, just, so to, we just in case there's so anyone who doesn't know, we're talking yeah. about monthly recurring revenue. So yeah, exactly. what, what, what yeah. have you sold this month? Yeah. So if you, if you start to see, for example, in that very early stage, we're still iterating on the product. We are selling it, but it's kind of bespoke sales done by the founders or the co-founders or, or, the, or the early team. If you're starting to see the trend line of that moving in the right direction, yes, that's indicators that actually the product is working on some very basic level, or even beyond the very basic level. The commercial approach is starting to work. So then it's like, well, actually, how do we then systematize that and accelerate it? Yeah, so then how are you going to we... repeat that? You're going to have to have some kind of machine in place to be able to sort of to, to do machine that. Machine is a great word. Yeah, machine is a great word. So how do I build a product organization and a sales and success organization right. that, that doesn't that rely on the, on the founders doing it all? <laughs> yeah. Now, where early stage companies can get into real trouble is... They haven't got product market fit, but what they decide to do is scale everything up. So they go, I've just got a million and a half in investment. So I'm going to hire a bunch of salespeople, a marketing person, and I'm going to hire a CS, put all this stuff in and magical things will happen. And sell the wrong product. Don't. Right. And that's very, very expensive. I haven't got mistake, the product ready. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't got the product ready. Or the best case scenario there is you realize that. And then unfortunately you have to let half or three quarters of the team go and then reorient back onto the product. So it's not always a case that having money and resources is actually going to help you win. It's, a, it's a, so much of it is about timing. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, okay, now that, that makes total sense to me. Okay, so coming back to the question, 
because we slightly veered off, but in a very interesting direction, which I completely get. But going back to sort of measurement and customer success management. So what are the types of measurements that, that the customer success management team might be involved in, in assisting their company to be measuring and proving that are going to be of interest to the venture capitalists? And how does that work? Well, I think for some, at that, at that very, very early stage, some kind of line in the sand which says, actually, these types of usage characteristics equate to customers getting value, right? Whether that's this many users, this much consumption of certain features, whatever it is. So if you can show a progression of that month on month to say, well, month on month, we're getting a greater proportion of customers hit these usage characteristics, that's a really good thing in the early stage. For a later stage business, which may have figured that out and is now actually in a bit more of a, a, a mach- the machine is cranking up a little bit better, a bit more repeatably, then you want to look at things like ARR, right? You want to look at uh, ARR, how, what's the incremental ARR growth month on month, quarter on quarter, What's the deployment time? You know, is deployment time getting shorter and shorter because the shorter the deployment time, the faster we should be getting the value. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then there's, you know, I personally think the sentiment metrics like NPS at the early stage should belong to the whole company, not just to the success department. So, I agree. yes. Um, so, you know, that one could be one that CS is aligned to but doesn't necessarily own because everybody should own that. Right. Yes. So yes. Because the think, customer experience of the early, the customer experience of the early stages is is not just due to customer success, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Correct. So it, it might be where the success or failure manifests itself because they're at the end of that production line, but it's not it, it's it's not where it's not where it is. So so I think in those early stages, it's got to be very much around usage patterns, usage characteristics, and then I think later it will, it, you know, uh, not much later, it'll be much more about. Uh, you know, and the, the the monthly and annual recurring revenue, and then eventually the net revenue retention. I think that's probably the key metric for any success team is for all the customers we're working with, how much revenue are we retaining and how much are those customers growing by revenue? All right. Straightforward question for you then to sort of, because I mean, we've, we've, I think we've covered, a, a, you know, we've covered what the venture capital is. We've covered how they help, what they're looking for in return. Uh, the relationship between customer success management and, and the venture capitalists. So like in, the, in the final sort of, I don't know what, five, 10 minutes or so, um, practical considerations, Ralph. <laughs> uh, what makes for a strong and valuable customer success management function from the perspective mm-hmm. of a venture capitalist? Well, I think it's first and foremost, a team that's oriented towards goals that are really important to the company. So whether whether or not the goal is ARR, whether it's uh, MPS at an early stage, whether it's uh, time to value, so long as the team is essentially its mission, its, its mission in life. Okay, that's the end of part two. The final part, part three, will be released very soon. But that's it for now from me, Rick Adams. To make sure you get notified when part three, and indeed when all my podcasts get released, please sign up to my Practical CSM YouTube channel. Just type Practical CSM into the YouTube search box and my page will come up. Remember to both subscribe and select the bell icon for notifications. Thank you.